Hello there, and welcome to the Counselor's Kitchen, where the food is therapy and the kitchen table is safety. We want to have a conversation today, so we've got just the spot for you right here at the kitchen table where we talk about life and everything it has to offer. So pull up a seat and join the conversation right here at the Counselor's Kitchen table. People used to be afraid of me. talking to my sister, you know, a few Christmases ago, and, and I was asking her, why, you know, you never used to hang out with me. because you were mean. <laughs> <laughs> and in talking about it with my mother, I was mean because I was angry, and I was angry because I was afraid. Mm. So what you have to do is deal with the fear. The fear will take care of the anger, and the anger will take care of the crazy. The time to decide not to get angry about something is before you get angry about anything. You got to have a game plan in place for how you're going to conduct yourself, how you're going to deal with upset. And you got to know who you are. You got to dissect where you're weak, where, what's wrong with you. I got a list of, 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 of 20 things I know that are wrong with me. I own it. I love it. I relook at it sometimes just to make sure yeah. I'm on top of it. Now. You're fearful, you're angry, and you've been hurt. And you're afraid that if you do not knock somebody out verbally or whatever, that they're going to take you down. Mm -hmm. So that's how you respond. So you got, to, you got to own that every morning. And then you have to say to yourself, self, <laughs> today, just today, I'm not going to get angry. Just today. Don't worry about tomorrow. And you have to have, you got to let the first wave pass you by. I said, what I'm going to do today, he says or does something I don't like, I'm going to do like this. It's a ridiculous thing to do, but do it anyway. <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> Just surrender. Not to him. You surrender to your better self. I put my first brother in jail in 1994. He didn't mind going to jail. He would say, well, Judge, why are you bothering me? Well, I can go to jail. Just go ahead and do it. I don't want to deal with your probation conditions and your anger management, and I'm not going to talk to the guy that I hit and resolve it so I cannot go to jail. I'll just do the year. We used to pick cotton. Now we are the cotton. We are the product in the system, in the paid prisons that they make money off of. And they count on you guys not being able to handle your emotions. So you go. Not over millions of dollars. Not over the health and welfare of your wife and children. Some words. Every brother I sent to prison, didn't know what the fight was about. All he knew is how he felt about it. I am my ego. I can't take that. I can't be disrespected. I need you to sit whatever nonsense happened today down. Because it matters to me what happens to my people. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, everybody. It is another episode of the podcast the Counselor's Kitchen Table podcast. I'm so elated to have uh, my wonderful guest. Go ahead and tell them who you are and a little bit about yourself. Hi, this is Judge Lynn Toller, currently of Hip Hop Boot Camp or Marriage Boot Camp, formerly of Divorce Court and author of Dear Sonali, Letters to the Daughter I Never Had, which is why I met him, which yeah. seems weird. Right. That, that, that letters to the Daughter I read it to me, led, me, led me to meet him, but... I did a room called Sonali's Room and Clubhouse mm -hmm. where I opened up women talking to women about all their issues. And I was going to talk to all my daughters, my dear Sonali. And mm -hmm. Davion got up on that stage and he waited and he waited. And now he has our voice from the male perspective. So he has, he has made a home at our site and we're very glad to have him. Absolutely. As always, I'm always, uh, everybody knows, I'm, that's always my aim is to be a, a blessing. Uh, I was raised by my mom and raised by nothing but women, good women. And uh, me and my mom had enough wisdom to put me in the church and keep me before good men. Uh, I never had any any bad issues or any issues with ministry. Thank God I, I was really a part of a, a great, genuinely wholesome ministry. No 
ill intentions, foul intentions, right. and like that. So I, I, I bless God for my mom's wisdom and in, in knowing how to rear me. So uh, I'm always ready to be a blessing. I have a passion for people and, and I'm grateful for that. And I'm so grateful to have met you and spent some time with you uh, and work with you. So uh, you all know it's a, it's a great episode. Again, this episode is about people. And I want us to understand that Judge Lynn, although she is a, a public figure, she's a person. And so we're going to uh, talk about our story today and talk about uh, good things to help people. So um, with that in mind, we're going to start off with our word of the day, guys. And our word of the day is solidarity. Okay. okay. And uh, the first definition is union or fellowship um, arising from common responsibilities and interests between members of a group or between classes. The second definition says community, a feeling, purpose, perspectives, etc. The third definition says a community of responsibilities or common ground. All right. In that word, in that definition, anything sticks out to you? Any any commentary there? You know, I think I, I might have a little odd view of this. I, I, I believe in solidarity. I believe in the ability for a community to get things done that an individual mm -hmm. can't. If we wanted sewers or, or streets, you have to move in solidarity and common in, in common interest. What what causes me fear about solidarity as mm -hmm. it's often displayed today is uh, we are getting uh, trapped in ever smaller groups with which to be in solidarity. And we are getting these, these very, very large uh, hurdles to stay in that group. In other words, the groups are getting, you know, there are acts that are appropriate in that group and that they're inappropriate. And the minute you do something inappropriate for that group, you are no, no longer in solidarity with that group. And I think we should be in solidarity, first of all, as a human race. We haven't pulled that off in, in tens of thousand years, but okay. Yeah. But then once you have solidarity within the group, that does not exclude new or different ideas. That's the only thing that I would say to those who are speaking about solidarity. It's not as exclusive as it is um, appearing these days, yeah. at least on social media. Absolutely. And, th and that's a part of growth, right? Change is a part of growth. It's Absolutely. Part of growth. Uh, one of the words that um, there are, there are two words that stick out uh, to me within the confines of all three definitions. One is union, and the other one is community. Right. Right. Uh, both of those which include people. Right. Uh, because you can't be a union by yourself. You know. No, you, you cannot. Together and 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 create a union. Same with community. You can't be a community all by yourself. You have to come together with people, and um and create a community. Um, another thing that really gets with me too is, um, in the first definition, it says common responsibilities. I think that oftentimes when it comes to this word, we kind of throw away that understanding that we are responsible one to another. We have a responsibility right. one to another. And typically that responsibility is common, meaning there's a goal in mind, there's a structure. Right. Uh, there's a movement in mind, and we're right. all responsible for the contribution of that movement, of that solidarity. And uh, I think that's where we fail in what you were saying about new ideas or anything that comes along that looks different. Now you're no longer a part of that. Exactly. Community. And it's so very dangerous because we could all live alone in these silos of very narrow thought. And when yeah. you do that, your thoughts don't get any better. Your Your, your thoughts denigrate because they haven't been challenged, they haven't been upgraded, and there's always something new to learn. So, you know, and we're so busy screaming my rights, my rights, my rights these days. I have a right to this, I have a right to that. But as loud as you holler about your rights, you must holler about your responsibilities. And I just don't think, and, and we all have a responsibility in part to keep from losing our minds when we have mm -hmm. a, a universal, uh, difficulty which with we're all trying to deal so everybody's yeah. screaming about my rights within the pandemic but mm -hmm. you have responsibilities within it as well absolutely. so i'm not asked to make it worse absolutely awesome awesome i think we've broken down uh this word of the day really really greatly and um for those who may not know uh you are a judge um you have been in office for how many years or uh i was first elected in 1994. okay 
Okay. Probably uh, before some of your listeners have more born. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's and that's a beautiful thing. So you've had some longevity in it. Uh, and being a judge, there there has to be a sense of solidarity, right? Uh, but also you you work a lot with marriages and relationships, which also require a lot of solidarity. So I think we're gonna dive into this uh, with some of these questions that I have for you and understanding more and more what that word truly means. And so uh, many also don't know that you're an advocate for mental health and have dealt with your share of mental disturbances in your life. What was your earliest experience with understanding mental health and how did it impact the work you do for yourself and others? Ooh, that's interesting. I, I always understood that we had mental health challenges in my family when I was a little girl. I mean, there was always there was always something going on. Mm -hmm. um, when I first realized that it wasn't uh, restricted to our household yes. and that it is a problem that is really distressing and disturbing the social fabric was when I became a judge in Cleveland Heights and the number of people who came into court and came into conflict with the law simply because they had uh, emotional problems or mental health issues and we treated them like criminals, which is all well and good, but they're gonna get back out. If you treat them, you know, treat them like they're sick as well, then yeah. you have an opportunity to alleviate the problem, but, but we aren't able to do that. And, and in a society that has um, decided that, you know, I, I I don't know. It's just mental health has to be taken into consideration in everything that you do. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think one of those main factors come from, again, that lack of responsibility and solidarity, meaning right. that not my problem. Or I don't have to deal with it. So, you know, I can turn a blind eye. Well, no, if yeah. everything we do affects someone everything else. Everything we do, right. Which affects someone else. And if we ever thought about that and that capacity and in that headspace, then we'd be more careful, number one, with the choices we make, but then absolutely what we allow in our midst. And so I think that that responsibility factor, being able to check uh, people when they're wrong, which doesn't happen anymore, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to children, right? Children, right. To, to hold people accountable and responsible for their actions, but also making sure you're, you're supporting the needs. Right. That, um, yeah, definitely. It, it makes an impact. And so I understand that. Um, now, again, you are a, uh, um, a marriage extraordinaire, love expert. How did you meet your husband? And what were some of those qualities that you believe qualified him for your soul? I was 27 years old. I was at a, a Cleveland Cavaliers game. And I walked into the loge and a, a woman, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, was standing there. And she says, do you have somebody? And I said, well, no. And she went and introduced me to Eric, Big E, the guy who would become my husband. He had just gotten divorced and was a little bummed out. So he said, oh, let me bring this young chick around and see if they can, can light him up a little bit. And then um, I met him and another guy at the same time. And the other guy called me and I didn't like him. I liked the, the one I got now. And I was so mad because I thought they had talked about it and they decided the other guy would pursue me. But uh, Big E didn't call me for three weeks. And I asked him years later, why did it take you so long? He says, because I knew if I called you, it wasn't just going to be a small, lighthearted thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I had to know that I was ready in my head to have a serious relationship with somebody, which was to me, extraordinarily mature. Wow. That's interesting. Woo. That's very interesting. Uh, um, Cause a lot of people in that kind of headspace, they think oh, there's games involved and all that kind of stuff, but yeah, absolutely. It's very mature to be able to recognize uh, I need to make sure I'm in the in the right place right head space. Yep. Yeah, to pursue this. That's awesome. I love that. Um, now, oftentimes we believe that love alone is enough to make a marriage or a relationship work. Um, but what would you say are some important su supporting factors uh, that foundationally support love in a healthy relationship? Yeah, like, you know, love is like the gas in a car. It's what, it, what, what's helped you start it up and it gives you the energy to keep going. But you have to have the whole car there. You have to have uh, a steering wheel and wheels and you have to have a bonnet. You have to have a roof on your car. The roof is often 
a much, you have to have your economic situation together. And if you don't at least understand what you're doing with money and agree on that, you have to be able to communicate because you're going to be solving problems throughout your entire relationship. So if you don't have a sound ability to communicate, then it, then no matter how much you love each other, if you can't understand each other and give what, give each other what they need, uh, then you won't be able to, uh, then you won't be able to maintain your relationship. So there are a lot of things that has to go into, you know, the ability to compromise, the ability to uh, also, I always say, you know, you were talking early, the, earlier about solidarity. And I always say, you know, your marriage is like this little country. It's mm -hmm. like the little country Toller Mumford here. And that we fight for the integrity of our country and we don't let other people dip in and bop in and emails and, and Gmails and, and uh, social media and DMs. We don't do all of that. If I can't post it in front of him, I don't post it at all. And I don't respond to people in a way that would make me go like this if he was standing behind me. Yes, awesome. There's a lot of respect there. I hear, uh, I hear that word kind of from what you're saying. And I do believe there are a lot of other factors. I think that, um, you know, I always look at love as there is a, um, when you're building anything great, right, and, and anything of statue, uh, you have to go deep first right. before you go up. You have to go down before you go up. And I would say love is like that, the foundation of the surface that we see. You mm -hmm. may have a thick slab of concrete that then you build a house on, right? But then right. there's more concrete down below that mm -hmm. that you can see, right? And I think there's a multitude of other things that go underneath to support and sustain that foundation of love. One of the things I pretty much heard you say is um, is respect, pretty much, mm -hmm. having respect for one another. Uh, I think the word commitment, I think we, we've we gotten so far away from what a true commitment is mm -hmm. um, in these sort of relationships and situationships nowadays that commitment is, isn't even on the table anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we're together, we'll say we're together, but we can do other things. And, and, right. and that. so there's a lot of other things that foundationally should support love deeper than the foundation of love, which is only surface level. It's only what you, you know, see and, and obtain and things of that nature. And uh, I think it's definitely worth getting into, especially if you're in, in a relationship and going into a relationship, uh, you definitely should seek out those other things that come under the umbrella of love and make sure those things are right. Because if those things aren't right, then the deeper foundation gets cracked. That's a bigger problem altogether. You know, trust and all those other fundamental things, communication. So very good perspective. I love that. And um now, here's a, uh, um, another thing that I believe, in, and I want your perspective and opinion commentary on this. I believe that there are mainly two ways we are capable of loving someone, and that is loving from ourselves and loving for ourselves. Um, and that's kind of what, what's in my perspective. In your perspective, what do you think of that concept? Do I need to explain it a little better? I mean, I, I think I get what you see, what you're saying. I tend not to, I tend to try to avoid the labeling thing. This is, there are two ways to do this, this and that. There's a lot of ways to love somebody mm -hmm. and, and, and from ourselves too. I mean. Do I need to clean it up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, okay. could, yeah. Could you do that for me? So from my perspective, loving from ourselves and for ourselves, loving from ourselves is we reach inside first mm -hmm. and, and then give that mm -hmm. uh, loving for ourselves is we look what we look for what we need uh in that person or in that significant other and we pull in mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we're reaching out meaning uh i know what i can give i know what i can offer i offer my love mm -hmm. Versus, I need love. I need. I need some completion in order to reciprocate. So, mm -hmm. just two different perspectives on. Perspectives, yeah, on, yeah. And and I tend to, you you know what the, what got stuck in my head is, I tend not to. I tend when I talk about especially romantic relationships to talk mm -hmm. practical things like yeah. communication or or how to resolve a problem or right. you know you know the you know, hey, you want to go to San Diego, I want to go to the Grand Canyon. What do we do to resolve it? So, 
I mean, I would imagine that 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 dichotomy that you talk about is can be very true. I just I don't quite know what it means in 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 when it's at home. That's you're with yeah. me. No, I I get what you mean. I, I absolutely get what you mean. Um, like I say, I, I I've done a lot of um, character study, a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of interviewing married couples. Mm -hmm. I'm not married. Uh, I've only ever been in relationships, but um, marriage is something that I take serious. You know, mm -hmm. when I find that one, it's it's something that I I want seriously. So I do a lot of preparing. I guess you can right, say. right. Uh, and a lot of what I've observed from people as far as, far as their romantic relationships have, have been either one or the other, meaning I have a need that needs to be fulfilled. And, and when that need is fulfilled, then I can show up in love or I have so much love to give and I'm going to give that love. And and and, and eventually there's going to be some reciprocation that has to happen uh, in the latter end. But uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And what are some practical things as far as that's concerned, um, just relationship, general solving, things like that. What are some techniques that you like to use? The first thing my husband and I did when we, we, we got engaged was went to a marriage council before we got married. We did personality tests. Mm -hmm. So the psychiatrist or the psychologist was help us to walk through it. This is how she feels about this. This is how she expresses love. This is what she needs. These are her tendencies. So we could really understand things about ourselves that we didn't understand before. And they also gave us a test that allowed us to understand our relationship to the institution of marriage itself. And I was very uh, incompatible with the relate with the of uh, marriage itself, the institution mm -hmm. itself. So I had to do a whole lot of work to, mm -hmm. to do that. So you have to figure out who you are on an ongoing basis. And mm -hmm. you do have to figure out what you're doing. You have to have the ability to step away from your relationship on a regular basis and say, where are we headed? What's going on? Are we are in a habit of, of, of being angry or being upset? Are we in the habit of thinking we're hearing what they're saying and not really? And, um, you know, learn how to communicate. Timing, tone, and topic is everything. Don't say it at your full voice the minute you feel it. Wait a bit. You know, there, there are a lot of things that you can do as a practical matter to... Uh, grease the grease the wheels of one's love yes absolutely uh, another one i like to use when you said time uh, tone and what was the third one T timing tone and topic because ah. you, you always is not a topic yeah. you have to okay today yeah. you did this this is why i'm not happy with it absolutely absolutely um one of the things that and and uh we we've done love uh topics before and things like that and i had a a guy on his name was uh jed Ruchenko. he has a book out um about making marriage work and things like that and and one of the things he talked about was pausing for your perspective uh meaning when something is said to you or you're having a discussion conversation with your significant other before you respond pause for some perspective hello that's really good. Hello. The, yeah. All the greatest disputes in our house have the longest pauses. He yeah. says something. I got this is why. What are you saying? This is what I think he's saying. I'm not really sure. Do I have to, you know, I say, can I, can I get you to explain it again? You have to, you know, the pause is the place. It, the Absolutely. pause is the place where all the thinking occurs. Absolutely. So my next question says, what are the mental or emotional effects uh, of forever being attached to the wrong person, in your opinion. Oh man, that can be crushing. I mean, it, but it depends on in what manner they're wrong for you. If they're wrong for you, and the, to the extent that they don't allow you to fulfill what you need and who you are and want to be, that can that can whittle you away into feeling nothing. Uh, you could be with the wrong person because they're controlling, because they are, you know, uh, for you know, demanding, you could, you, mm -hmm. you, you could be in, in contact with a wanter. That's somebody who always wants something more, 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 more. And uh, you can be with somebody who, who loves you, but doesn't really respect who you are as a person. So that can, that can make you into a different person. It can destabilize you and, 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 and make you less than you are. And you have to be able to uh, be able to step back from that and mm -hmm. figure out why you feel the way you feel and what, what your marriage or the relationship you're in, uh, how it is leaning on how you feel. 
Absolutely. That's that's so good. And I love that you say that because um, I know reflecting in and of myself, I know I can be very demanding at times. Um, and honestly, there is a there's a level of my mom used to say all the time, whoever ends up with you is going to be a special woman. I said, I know she's got to be <laughs> because I know I, I personally know that I can be you know demanding and I can be very pushing, not in, in the regard of uh, wanting more because I give everything I want first. So I'm, I'm one of those that loves from myself, meaning I, I'm gonna give it before I ever ask for it. Uh, but I can be demanding in the, in the factor of, I want you to do more because you can. Right. I'm gonna do better and I'm gonna push you in a better space. And and I get it for some people that doesn't work. You know, some people nope. have yeah. walk their own path and, and march to the beat of their own drum and even hit their heads before they mm -hmm. figure things out. But I get it, so whoever, Whoever's uh, single and think you want to mingle with Davion, just let I'm letting you know I'm gonna push you, okay? I'm gonna push you to be the best you can be because it's just it's just who I am. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Another perspective I wanted to offer too is that um, in that same interview I was talking about earlier, we talked we we kind of discovered this this concept of offering grace, right? And in that he talks about how uh, eighty to ninety percent of the arguments that people have in their relationship literally has nothing to do with the other person. Uh, meaning, because we talk a lot about trauma on this podcast, meaning that that person has gone through this, that, thus, and so way before they ever knew you. And a lot of times we repeat things. We have cycles, you know, patterns of behaviors we, we repeat based off of our experiences. So 90% of the time, if we're arguing and that person responds in a certain way or in a, in a certain light, it has nothing to do with you. Most of the time, 80 to 90% of the time, it, it has nothing to do with even the problem. It's them responding in a way that, that strikes a chord with them. And that's something that they have to learn to deal with. And they have to be able to acknowledge in and of themselves. So I love that you say that because, like you said, what makes a person wrong for you? Sometimes they just don't see themselves. You know, and they just don't know who they are, so they can't be of aid. And or else they know who you are, they are, but you're not the right person. You know what I mean? If you've got yeah. two really nervous people, absolutely you can love each other and know who you are, but you're not good for one another because you guys, you know, wind each other up. Right. I'm a very nervous person who married a calm person. But I say that for the reason of the word solidarity, meaning that the responsibility. I can't. I can't own up to my responsibility to you in this relationship because I have some things that are holding me. Back. I got you. Yes. Yeah. Same. I got you. I got you. Absolutely. So that person may be the wrong person for you because they, they haven't dealt with their own traumas, their own mm -hmm. issues, things like that. And they can't, they can't show up for you in that solidarity way. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean by that. And you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Granted. So uh, my next question is, let me get back to the right one. Okay, here we go. During your time on the divorce court, you often talked to couples uh, and when given advice, you often told them there was a period in your marriage where you and Big E didn't like each other at all. Uh, can you describe some of those instances, some of those moments and, and talk about how you all worked through them? Well, it was just a matter of um, you know, my career kept changing. I, I was a lawyer, then I became a judge, and then I was on television. And I think we, and we moved, and there was a lot going on. And I got into the habit of not wanting to have a disagreement or argument because so much else was going on. So I would, I would tell yes all the time and okay all the time, even to things that I didn't agree on. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I got resentful, you know, mm -hmm. how, you know, but and we fought for like two years, but both of us were fighting to stay together, even though we were fighting each other at the time. Yeah. And nobody ever dipped out or tipped out or all this kind of stuff. We just was like adjusting to, cause you do, you get habitual about things, you know? And I habituated him to always getting his way. And when I decided, well, I don't want to do it that way. You know, he was, he was upset about it. So. Uh, we kind of reconfigured it. It took us a minute, but we well, we did it. Absolutely. That's and that's wonderful. A lot of that, uh, what you talk about is compromise and communication, right? It's a lot of times what you exactly what you said, habit. We get we're creatures of habit, we form habits, 
And then oftentimes after we form these habits and we've got in these comfort zones, we wake up one day and say, okay, this is a little bit further out. Than yeah. Be. It's not serving us well anymore. Now what do we do? What are we going to do? And I think that that's a part of this, this solidarity, right? It's always being willing to adjust, adapt for what's best for the community, what's best for the greater good. Absolutely. Of the community. So I love that. Um, now, my next question says, what makes elements, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. What elements make up true and genuine uh, commitment and why is commitment important in relationships? Well, it gives you a sense of security. If you know that both sides are committed, you can you you know you're going to run into trouble, even within the context of that trouble, that other person is going to be behind you, beside you, up under you, wherever you need them to be. So when, once you have that commitment, you have the ability to reach further than you would otherwise, because mm-hmm. you know, you know, he or she is back there and willing to, to hang in there with you. So um, commitment is for uh, the safety and security of both sides, you know, because you can you can really swing for the fences if you got somebody holding you around the center, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, so letting the other person know no matter what we're in it together, nothing like it. Wow, that's awesome, and I love that. Uh, yeah, commitment is very important to me. People uh, that know me know that I, I commit to completion, as my my pastor would say, commit to completion, meaning there's you, you, you're getting through it until it's done, you know. Right. Just on. keep at it till it gets the, till you get there. Exactly. So I love that. Um, now, in your book entitled uh, My Mother's Rules, you speak a lot about emotional intelligence and how she taught you to keep it together. Um, can you define or give a definition to that phrase? emotional intelligence what does that mean to you well it, it, it's 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 from originally daniel goldman's book emotional intelligence and it's about you know everybody thinks every you know how we progress as individuals is a function of our iq and certainly the ability to create technology is a function mm-hmm. of iq but everything else that we do also has an emotional component to it. So as you can see out there today, people going, you know, the Karens and the Karen equals, you, we, we don't have the capacity to feel something, stop and say, hey, is, is acting on that feeling the thing that I need to do in the moment? Mm-hmm. So I've always feared and it is, it is coming true that we have become emotionally detached from what we do. So in other words, I feel something and everybody got to know what it is and i got to make sure i feel better right now and that ain't true you know what i mean just because you feel bad doesn't mean somebody else is wrong or something needs correct sometimes you just feel bad Mm -hmm. and you just gotta you you gotta get through it or how you feel in the moment need not be what you do in the moment you don't want to scream at your kid wait a minute you know is he is he he in a position to hear it now is it is that the greatest lesson do i know what i'm doing you got to be on top of how you feel Cause um, you know how you feel can get on top of you, and then look what we get. We get all these shootings and mm-hmm. and and you know air rage and all the stuff because we are not emotionally well managed. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I love that. You know, I had um, the opportunity to pour into uh, a little when I had a um, I was in a relationship, and that young lady had a child. She had a son, and I oftentimes watched how he would melt down, you know, and of course he's a child, he's building right. up the universe, his house, you know, he's, as I, 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 I reference growing up as, as building a house in one of my former episodes, mm-hmm. but he's building his house, right? And, uh, and so there's going to be some mishaps, hangups, and some meltdowns and all of that. But I watched the way that he would melt down. And, and one of the things that I would often, um, I would often notice is that he would melt down in certain situations, but only in certain situations with certain people. Right. right exactly. And exactly. He, yeah. There was no. He knew he could, he, yes. Kids know who yeah. they can cut up with and who they can't oh. cut up with. Yeah. And and I always say with everything we do, we teach our children how to feel. So yeah. if you're with a nuclear responder that goes like this, the kids mm-hmm. are going to be going like this. They're going to mm-hmm. feed off of your energy. And if you have that calmer energy, you can you can allow that person to come along with you. I I, yeah. I think that is like the most important point to make. You know, if 
when you emote in front of your children, you're teaching them how to be. Absolutely. And you've got to remember that before you do anything. You're teaching them how, how to resolve a conflict. You lose your mind over something small, you're teaching Junior to lose his mind over something small. We can't do that. You know what I mean? So, and, and kids pick up on stuff. They know who's doing what to whom. Yeah. So, you know. Absolutely. And I love that. Like I say, it just, it, it was so funny to me, but it's very, very true. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows me, knows kids are my passion. I, I love children. And so we've done a lot of, uh, uh, of stuff talking about our children. And, and so it's very, very, um, that emotional intelligence piece. I just said all that to say this, it's not about you. It goes far beyond. At all. It goes far beyond you. Everything we do has an effect on someone looking, someone watching, someone that's connected to us, or someone that's not connected to us. Right. We have absolutely. To together. So absolutely. I love that. Um, so we're at the quote portion of our episode. This is where I talk about a quote that I mm -hmm. read or heard that changed my life and uh, I've put into practice. And so I read a quote that changed my life. It said, um, the one thing you have more power over than anything else is how you feel. If anyone can upset you, then everybody can hold you. Hold you. you. All right. Yeah. Um, correct me, Judge. Correct me. <laughs> hold you. Yes. And that is your quote. Can you yes. talk that a little bit and what you mean by that? Um, you know, everybody seems to get excited very easily th these days. And it seems that, um, you know, getting offended is almost a, 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 a badge of honor. I'm offended by what you said. I'm upset. I'm, I'm triggered. I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other thing. And like I said, you got the right to feel the way you want to feel. But if you run around wanting the world not to disturb you, uh, you're in deep trouble because the world will disturb you and they have no obligation not to disturb you. And your, the question is, who's going to be in charge of your day? Some random guy that says some random thing to you, or mm -hmm. are you going to be in charge of my day? If you do something that upsets me because you sit, call me a certain word or something, and I spend all day tracking on that, you have defined my day for me, and that's not what I intended. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I was back in 1963, my sister and I were integrating an all-white school, lower middle class school, and, you know, mm -hmm. I would say, Daddy, they called me the N-word. And he would say, okay, hmm. you know, what are your grades like? They won't let me in the pool. Go down to this other pool. Can you, are they were mean to me at the other pool? You know, uh, do you know how to swim? No. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, everybody's going to hurt your feelings all the time. And if, if you let them, if they, if you let what other people say determine how you feel, then the rest of the world will own the world, will, will own your day. And you don't want that to happen. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Um, and, and I love that you said, um, I just lost it that quick, but you that's all right, honey. I do it all the time. <laughs> yes. You talked about owning, uh, your day. That's what it was. Letting mm -hmm. somebody else now own your day and they have to go, you have to go find it. Um, right. that's very, very true. It's like, um, I often talk about how thoughts, and, uh, and and feelings are like um, are like holding a, a bow and arrow, right? Mm -hmm. the, the arrow is a trajectory where everything right. is gonna go. And what happens is, is once you release it, you can't stop it from going where it's going. Right. So make sure that before you you release that strap, that it, it's aimed exactly where you need. Where it. you want it to go. Absolutely, I love that metaphor. It's a very Absolutely. good one. Your thoughts, your emotions are just like that. They're just like the bow and the arrow, and you have to know where it's going. You have to know where before yep. you piece it. So, um, and your words as well. So all of those things encompass uh, and, and can communicate and kind of advocate how you feel and your emotional state and things. Absolutely. Like that. So absolutely, I love it. We've had a great time, a great interview, and now I'm going to ask for this is our takeaway portion. Uh, any thoughts or challenges um, or expectations that you can give to the listener for the next seven days, something practical to help make it through the week? Um, make sure you notice your environment. Mm. 
every day. Go outside, look at the sun, look at the cold, look at that. We, t- we, we tend to be very screen focused and then our lives become very, very tight. We live them through our eyes and no longer through our, our, our noses and taste and all that kind of stuff. Enjoy the world while you're doing your thing. Mm-hmm. That's what I would just every day make a point of looking outside and say, boy, it's beautiful or it's sunny or look at that snowflake, that kind of thing. Make a point of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's awesome. Um, it's the simpler things that kind of change us in life. Right. Right. Um, my takeaway from from this episode um, is definitely. um We talked a lot about that emotional intelligence piece. And of course, in the past, I've talked about uh, learning how to be in touch and in tune with your your traumas and things of that nature, knowing how to not to let them control you, right? Um, In this episode, I want to specifically talk about the emotional piece. Um, Own your emotions. That's what I challenge and expect the audience to do this week is own your emotions, own how you feel, own up to it. Oftentimes you hear things like, uh, you know, you start a war within yourself when it is that you just kind of put things on the back burner, mm-hmm. submit to an idea or anything like that and kind of suppress it. And you start a war within yourself. And and, and I, I'm encouraging us in order for the sake of mo- emotional intelligence, the word there is intelligence. Intelligence literally means knowledge. Mm-hmm. Right? So having knowledge of what your emotions are, what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're speaking, whether they're lying to you or not, because sometimes our emotions lie to us, you know, sometimes. Right, right, it, right, right. This or something is that, and it's not even. But uh, just that is my my takeaway, and that's my challenge. Own your emotions. Take Absolutely. Them, take charge of them. Get to know them, understand them, and then make sure you can process them the way that they are meant to be processed. I often say that emotions are uh, indicators, not navigators, meaning right. they direct you to a problem, but they should not direct your solutions. Exactly. Absolutely. So any last words that you have, uh, Judge Lynn? No, I just enjoyed uh, our conversation this morning. Thank you for having me on, and I wish you wish you all the best with your podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. And uh, so our last thing is any anything that you want to talk about, any projects, any promotions, anything that you're more than welcome, uh, any social media outlets, any, uh, the Sonali Room, talk, you mm-hmm. know, anything that you got going on, if you want. Nothing. I'm working on a new show called uh, Convener. Well, am I supposed to tell it or not? I don't know, but it's, I'm filming it. I'm filming it down in Atlanta, so I, I can't wait till everybody sees that. Everybody's been asking for a kind of a marriage boot camp for regular folks, and it's not like marriage boot camp, but it's for regular folks with relationship issues. So uh, awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, again, at the real Judge Lynn, is that correct? That's your uh, social media handles. It is indeed. Awesome. And make sure that if you're not in Sonali's room, go ahead and join it on Clubhouse. It is an iPhone or Apple uh, exclusive app, unfortunately. But if you have Apple, go ahead and join it. And um, I just, again, look forward to to more to come. I thank you for everything. And uh, I tell you all at the end end of every every episode, excuse me, I'm having tongue ties right now. Uh, Go and be great because you can and you already are. Uh, This is season three premiere, premiere, and I'm so elated um, to have you judge and and all the great things that are to come with it. So uh, you all have a blessed one. And again, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.